Hi, I'm Priscilla. Uh, I work as a freelance creative consultant specializing in artists and nonprofits. I'm also a writer, arts administrator, and visual artist, and author, um, communications director for All City Murals as well. And Joe is an award winning artist, architect, writer, photographer, poet, um, and in Georgia has amazing work. Um, my name is Sean Martin. I'm a registered architect. I work for MARTA. My artist medium would be uh, jewelry. I also write and uh, a few other things. Um, uh, and I, I do a lot of the community art as well. My name is Turp. I'm a Decatur based artist in Stadra as well. on new development, which gives us a spending budget of about $5,000, and they just want something that's not a mural at this point. They're trying to expand what's going on in the area, they want to get people involved, so maybe something involved with performing arts, some kind of theater, just not a mural. So for our prompt, we identified this area as something related to Kennesaw, so the rest of our project is based on us working with Kennesaw. So the project process that we uh, we decided to shoot for is um, we really needed, I think you've heard a lot about how it's important to extract feedback from the community to get their engagement. So what we decided to do was to basically sculpt a program that would allow us to do that while promoting art at the same time. So our vehicle uh, would be a, a four-part uh, series of tours and performances that would culminate into brainstorming sessions. And because Kennesaw, Georgia, is the history of it is rooted in the Civil War, uh, a lot of historical significance there, a lot of uh, uh, places of interest that relate to American history, we figured that this would be a great way to bridge the identity of the city and the arts initiative together. It's also a driving community, so trying to convince, you know, a person or family to jump in their car to, to you know, make the trek to really invest in the arts in this way, uh, we just felt like it was a win-win for all. Um, and so with that being said, the prompt related to uh, an RFP response. Um, we would basically meet together, talk, rally our hearts and minds around the initiative, and, uh, and shoot to win. Um, and then we would initiate meetings with the Kennesaw Arts and Culture Commission. We actually thought that there was no arts uh, entity in, with the city of Kennesaw, but we were pleasantly surprised to know that as recent as October 15th, they actually have an arts and culture commission within the city of Kennesaw government. So they're just at the very early stages of form it, forming uh, a, a group that uh, will, will proliferate the arts in the community. Uh, once we get those meetings going with the, the arts and culture commission, we would establish a list of stakeholders, refine that list, um, we'll extract champions, meet regularly, and establish project goals. So once again, the importance of getting community engagement, uh, stakeholder buy-in, the feedback, really going at the whole process together as one is critical to this whole process. So after we do that, we develop a sponsorship matching incentive. Even though our prompt talked about the 1% uh, for development fees, we felt the need to really get the community engaged uh, and in this by way of sponsorship or corporate sponsorship um, so that we would have that pool of money and then we would match that uh, from a, co a corporate level. Um, we would then conduct community work sessions, go back again, refine those project goals, reassess the plan, and uh, basically uh, have our four tours that ended up with the performance and the brainstorm session. Okay, so
So we identified several potential sites where we could have pulled both um, either community engagement sessions or the final performances. So this is a view of the downtown Kennesaw area. Um, you can see the existing green spaces and sidewalks, and these dash lines are um, potential future trails that would connect the major roadways and these would be kind of gateway areas to the downtown area. Um, so this is one place where we could have post something on the existing green spaces, but also there's the potential for this to be a centralized downtown art space, um, similar to what's going on with Art on the Belt Line, where they post things every year there. Okay, and this is an existing pedestrian tunnels, um, which is possible for poor corner space on the inside of the tunnels and sidewalks. Um, Kennesaw Mountain Battlefield National Park, it's a place where families are already go to congregate on the weekends, and a lot of historical reenactments take place. Um, Big Shanty Art Station is a free public space available in one of the parks. Um, you could possibly harness their resources and volunteers. And then another stakeholder would be the Southern Museum of Civil War and Locomotive History and the uh, Kansas State University Museum. So a lot of resources available with them. So basically what we did, um, we, in this class, we reviewed a lot of case studies. Uh, case studies where we learned about artists that had uh, several projects, um, and we, we really tried to see where we could learn from other people's other other initiatives, and we selected three. Uh, the first one is the Roswell Arts uh, Fund and Cultural Master Plan. We thought this was a great uh, example of how a city actually did a cultural uh, mapping exercise that resulted in a uh, cultural master plan, if you will. So that's that's what we are intending to do through this. Um, the Roswell Arts Fund actually came out of that uh, exercise, and it is the entity that the city of Roswell works through in order to get the programming uh, moved forward. Uh, they also have a fantastic website um, that continues to engage the community, which is also something that we uh, hope to kind of spark. Um, in, this, in this process. Resurgence is actually a project I've worked on and it relates back to this theme of developing an identity and a history of the area. So Resurgence is a multidisciplinary annual performance. What you're looking at is a three-story tall puppet that is puppeteered by people in the community. It's rotating panels that form a phoenix and they also act as a projection screen. So the people organizing this project went out to Old Fourth Ward, they gathered interviews with people that live there, they gathered news footage, they gathered history. So while the performance is happening, you're seeing newsreels, you're hearing interviews from people that live there. There's also a live vocal performance from people in the community. So this piece goes up every year and it really celebrates the history and the identity of Old Fourth Ward and that history and identity is generated by people living there. And this was another case study, uh, the refuge performed by the Houston Grand Opera. Um, Houston happens to be one of the most diverse cities in America, um, behind New York, Miami, and a few others. Uh, and so what they, what they did, uh, along with an artist, was to celebrate the immigrant population uh, there. And so uh, the Houston Grand Opera, alongside uh, several uh, local uh, immigrants in the in the city uh, had this huge performance where they celebrated. I think it was like 12 different countries um, that were uh, that uh, made up their population. And I, I put this quote in here. Uh, this was a quote that um, came from five Congolese brothers in the finale presentation, where they said to the audience, "We are." Our stories are your stories. As a way, so so the artist used the medium opera to bring relevance to the immigrant population, which is kind of like killing two birds with one stone. So it was it was, it was a really really beautiful project. And so with this, uh, we decided to kind of dissect Kennesaw. And um, as I mentioned before, the Civil War and railroad history. Uh, it was, it's a city founded in 1887, population 32,000, median household income 62,000. A couple of other uh, uh, poignant um, uh, facts 
average household size, 2.6. Um, and so, uh, and so Kennesaw, we, we learned about Kennesaw. And this is a pie chart that shows this top lavender section is the white population, and all of these are the uh, growing minorities that continue to grow. And this is another uh, pie chart that illustrates how many uh, people actually drive. Uh, their commute involves working, service, work at home, carpooling, and bus. Moderate individuals, we have people that live there for generations, they have a strong tie to where they come from, they have a sense of history. There are students, there's college there, so there are people that are bringing a new identity and a new idea of what Kennesaw should be. And there's also the growing immigrant population who are bringing their own ideas, their own histories, and forging a new story for Kennesaw. All these people have their own interests, passions, skills, voices, and their own idea of what they feel like their hometown should be. There's lots of institutions, there's college, local businesses, restaurants, museums, they can provide donations and volunteers and resources. As far as physical assets, there's so much open space that can accommodate large crowds of people, including the mall, college football fields, Southern Museum, Civil War, all those sites we talked about earlier, lots of space to throw these large events. And as far as connections, the college has lots of students, associations, clubs, there's the burgeoning arts community, there's the people that we'll reach when we're doing these community workshops that will tell us about the leaders that they look up to in their communities. Lots of people for us to talk to and connect to get this work out. As far as stakeholders, lots of people talk to here. City politicians, existing arts community, it's growing. Churches is a huge one. We're going individually to churches and getting their involvement. Residents, immigrants, public and private schools, getting the kids involved. Uh, Kennesaw Business Association, Arts and Culture Commission, Kennesaw Historical Society is going to be huge. They already have an idea of who's interested in this project. And how landmarks and historical society. Okay, so some of the strengths we've mentioned already, there's a huge amount of assets and stakeholders that can be tapped into. Um, we've got built-in funding from the city. Uh, a lot of history buffs that might be interested in participating in this performance. Um, strong team of multidisciplinary artists and a previous president of the community for uh, community-based art. Um, some of the weaknesses are that the budget will be a challenge to make this sustainable, to repeat this every year. Um, so if it is repeatable, it would, the funding would have to come from other sources, potentially. Um, the city also doesn't have a clear direction for what they want for this piece or a clearly defined idea. Um, and there's no unified arts presence when you're driving through town. You don't necessarily see visual arts in your face as you might in some parts of Atlanta. Um, so that gives us the opportunity to create a new sense of community pride, um, contribute to a new kind of branding and identity for the city. Um, also gives us an opportunity to get earned or contributed income to supplement the project budget. Um, Changing political climate there, the city is becoming more progressive, so that's an opportunity as well. Um, some of the threats are the <laughs> <laughs> some of the threats are the small town politics, which can be difficult to work with. Um, preconceived notions as far as performance art um, and their attachment to the history, their role in the Civil War, they may not be as open to um, other types of branding their identity. Communications plan, we're just really trying to meet people where they're at. So for churches, we plan on going and speaking individually to them. We plan on going to laundromats and barbershops, talking to people there, spreading the message there, emailing people that prefer email, just really looking at all of our stakeholders and determining what is the best way to reach these people, where they're at, and how to engage them where they're at. Um, okay, yeah, so our messaging strategy is reaching out to stakeholders where they are. Um, so them where at, <laughs> as far as our level of artistic autonomy, instead of us trying to really direct where this goes, we're really planning to act as more facilitators and moderators. So we want to give citizens of Kennesaw a chance to voice and amplify their ideas of what their community is. And really our place is to facilitate an environment and an event and moderate it so that everyone has a chance to say what should be said and everyone has an equal voice. 
As far as documentation, throughout this we'll be collecting recordings, written submissions, photos, historical archives, anything anyone wants to submit. These will be kept on a website and a blog and will be archived at the library. The event itself will be documented via traditional video and 360 degree virtual reality video. So anyone who misses it or wants to experience it can be immersed in the experience. <laughs> <laughs> And there will be surveys distributed in paper format on the website, on social media, that will track attendance, people's opinions on the matter, whether or not we stuck to the funding correctly, all that important stuff people want to know to keep the projects. As far as the budget, we have that fantastic $5,000 from the city. <laughs> uh, we are offering booths at these events, so local restaurants can jump into that. Uh, we're out of time. So we love $2,000. Just just in case we don't get all the funding, stuff happens. Uh, but we are providing these for ourselves, covering insurance, the website, printing marketing, and we're also providing aid to performers who maybe need help getting costumes together, supplies for what they want. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so that would be the design and collection phase, and then analyzing the information that you get back from everyone. And then one of the most forgotten parts in community engagement is the dialogue phase, where you tell the community what you've heard from them. And that will get you more information down the line, that will get more uh, engagement in the course correction phase, where you have people involved in making what they want to see happen. And then you repeat it over, and it never ends, because you're supposed to be always engaged. Um, so our project, really what we were prompted to do by C4 is to figure out what the community wants to do with this vacant lot. Whether or not we can effectuate that depends on how convincing we can be to the owner of the vacant lot or to the development process that's ongoing in South Downtown. So uh, our intention is to go door to door, which we did for the 404 dinner, go door to door in the neighborhood to get buy-in, to get uh, business owners and residents interested in what's going on. To go to the um, condo meetings and talk to the residents of the three condos in the area to tell them what we're interested in doing and how we're going to do it. Um, and then we're going to do something like you saw when you came in the front door off the elevator. We're going to have open art days for a successive, uh, on one, one Saturday or Sunday a month for about three months where we invite people in. Um, they can participate in visual, musical, performing arts. Our improv leader will need groups of uh, improvisers that might be interested in participating to get buy-in, to get people to talk to us, to start thinking about options. Then we'll collect all these options. What do we do with this parking lot? And uh, we'll make them accessible uh, on a website, on Facebook, in various media. Then on the fourth month, we're going to have a huge extravaganza. We'll do an artist market, which is already sort of ongoing with the Mammal Gallery. Uh, we'll have music, music, musicians on the street. We'll have lots of participatory activity in terms of art making. And then our leaf blower painter, where we'll get a permit to close South Broad Street. We'll uh, paint the pavement white, whether or not we're allowed to. And then we're going to be using leaf blowing uh, leaf blowing, painting techniques, masking, and stencil to choose the three to five ideas of what to do with the parking lot and make it big on the pavement and get WSB to come over with a helicopter and take lots of video <laughs> and tell the city what needs to be happening down here so that some kind of shall we say pressure, might be um, put on developers for what we think ought to be happening in this neighborhood. <sighs> strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. Uh, our strengths are the diversity of activities and businesses that are going on down here, uh, the diversity of different performing arts and visual arts organizations. Um, uh, diversity and economic levels of people involved in the neighborhood. Um, our weaknesses, um, we don't have any money. So we have, to come up with <laughs> we have to decide how much we're willing to do for free. We have to engage all the different organizations and people in the neighborhood to get them so we can make our statement. So some opportunities that are existing are creating a shared identity between everyone in the area as well as how people see it from outside the area, turning the underground economy into taxpayers so we can keep the funding circulating. Um, a lot of the threats you'll see are actually perceived threats, so perception of safety, feeling of disempowerment. So those are really easily addressed through the arts and can be turned into um, We're looking to engage the deepest and broadest collection of ideas and opinions of what to do with a faith and lot that we possibly can. So that decision makers take notice. A lot of people down here feel very disenfranchised, very disempowered. Their voices don't matter. We're trying to emphasize that this is at least a way you can get engaged and talk. And so the way we would go up to each of the individual stakeholders would be in a way that to meet them where they're at. So we would take a business plan to the developers. If we're talking to someone on the street, we talk to them a few times, like you know, getting to know them, and then get to be their friend, and then get a call to action. 
Uh, for our artist community participation, um, we're really interested in serving as facilitators um, and co-creating with the community based on what they want to see happen. Budget. This could be a $30,000 project. It could be a $5,000 project. It depends on the buy-in from the community, how much income services we can get. Um, it, we, we generate funds through donations through all the stakeholders who want to have some voice. Understanding, of course, that property owners and the developers are themselves stakeholders. They may be interested. We think it's possible that the um, developers coming in uh, might be interested in knowing what it is that the community wants. They'd rather swim downstream than upstream. Why should they swim against what the community wants? Um, uh, also, uh, vendors fees at the artist market, um, various and sundry aspect uh, opportunities for um, branding, branded, uh, branded retail products that we might sell. There's also possibilities for um, placemaking initiatives to grant us money for this kind of research. So it's, you know, as I said, it's a project that could cost $30,000 or it could be accomplished for So, we have prepared a video for you guys um, to uh, speak to some of the voices of the community and what people do want to see. Quinn Mason. I'm an alto saxophonist and I'm heavily involved and invested in the art scene in South Downtown Atlanta. So I'm Mary Massad. I'm a board member here at Murmur. William Kennedy and I do the booking um, and a lot of the event coordination for the Mammal Gallery. Hi, I'm Tosh and I'm the interim executive director here at Murmur. My name is Patrick. How about just been here a long time, pretty much. A lot of people in this community are very wise and, and have been here for a very long time, and so they have a lot of insights. It's accessible by bike, it's accessible by transit, um, it's a dense area, which is really rare for Atlanta, um, and there's just so much access to things culturally. Venues such as the iDrum, Broad Street Visitor Center, Players Club downtown, and also the Mountain Gallery. Right now, the arts organizations are doing a really good job of providing this community with um, an introduction into different avenues that they don't necessarily have access to. Um, for instance, we provide a lot of the individuals who live here or around the streets with, you know, um, occupations. I just like it, just a place you can just walk in and look into art without paying a, a, a fee to get it. <laughs> the street has definitely gotten uh, more attention. More people want to venture down here, whereas before they wouldn't. A little version of a little five points. I don't even know why I even call it that. It's more like a, a takeover in the smaller sense of just doing it piece by piece. Mm -hmm. You know, just pushing the long time resident people, uh, people that have been here a long time out of the community and then where they're going to go. And kind of monopolize on what has been created by those. People, but not give them any credit or like have them be part of the new community. The ones that are coming in, you know, they blend in when they chose to blend in. And I see the ones that want to do something. I don't know who they're talking to as far as like wanting to do anything. You just go ahead and do it and just open that you like it and participate in it. And most of the people don't because they're not, they're not really used to it. Nobody ever explained it to them what you're doing, I, I guess, maybe because they didn't have any input when they was making all these decisions to just go ahead and just say, well, uh, I think they like this or I think they like that. If everything's going to get bought up, 
at least put some money back into the community and allow those who already have a stake in what's going on to operate as normal. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of these empty buildings that's around here, there's, they're already either purchased for something else that doesn't have anything to do with the community or they just sit into it over the side to get rid of it. I would not like to see a parking lot though. There's two more stations in between. Probably half of them don't even have transportation to like, even go to work or back and forth. I'd probably put something there that everybody can use. Oh, it might be a recreation center, it could be a basketball court. Mm. Mm. It could be uh, all kinds of possibilities. As long as everybody else can participate, that's what I do. Um, I think if we just had like a couple of restaurants, a couple of like local mom and pop stores, or uh, like a community lending library. I would say that it should probably be used to provide um, some sort of uh, food resources. Maybe it's some sort of urban garden or some sort of market that the community works in and the community maintains and thrives. Well, I'd love to see like a regular farmer's market happening down here provide some food, some kind of food options for folks, some kind of like community garden. More music venues like barbecues where you play music and stuff like that. People really like stuff like that, at least the ones that I know around here. I think they should probably just do a survey and ask them what we should do with this, uh, like you said earlier, this empty lot right here. What would you want to see right here? Instead of just building something and just hope somebody just comes. So I think if it's something that they have ownership over and that they're responsible for maintaining, then it would be beneficial. So if we just provided them with the space, I know that they would like build it up and help it to thrive. I say the more people involved, the better it is. Then they'll probably listen there. So if you're going to spend money, invest in the people that are already here. So my name is Maggie Benoit. Um, in the course of this hatch session, I've had the lovely opportunity of getting to know these two ladies a lot better. Um, Living in hard way. And Lenny Greg Norris. And um, we are group three. Um, a very ambiguous group three. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, just to kind of explain a little bit about our experience in hatch um, and, and what we've gained from it. Uh, I think coming together to understand what it means to work with community and, and how to really uh, leverage strategy for impact has been really imp an important part of the conversation that we've all had together. Um, so really targeting who our messaging needs to impact and how we get that message to them in the best uh, way to implement change and, and what does that change look like and how do we get there over a period of time. So we really tried to take that into consideration. Um, during the course of, of putting this project together. Should I go ahead and just start? Why don't you go ahead and introduce okay. your... Yeah, so I think our comp, unlike a lot of the others that you'll see today, um, it deals specifically with a rural community um, of roughly about 10,000 people. So we really, um, in, in deciding how to move forward, thought that uh, doing some hardcore research on a, a specific community to target would really help us in putting together facts um, that would be relevant to developing a proposal that worked. Uh, so in targeting this local community of roughly 10,000 people, we also have been granted $3,500 from the government um, to really focus on community heritage. Our community, this theoretical community, once had a lot of heritage and due to a depletion of resources, closing, closing of an agricultural center, closing of a factory, there had been a lot of jobs lost and therefore the population had declined significantly and therefore pride in the community had, had been depleted. So it's our job to kind of reignite that heritage and also create an answer to that loss in population and therefore also um, an exchange of commerce that, that would result in reinvigorating the community again. In addressing that $3,500 grant, we are also responsible to come up with a match of another $3,500 um, as we lay out a landscape um, of uh, addressing particularly the, the cultural heritage piece. Do you want me to go ahead and continue? 
Yeah, so um, <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead. Um, excuse not having visuals. Um, but in that, we started to really think about cotton production, being as we're here in Georgia, and that's already a rich part of Georgia's history um, on, on both a racial and economic standpoint. Uh, we have the port in Savannah, which is a large port city for trade here in the southeast um, that, that is very relevant to using things like agricultural production and what that means in terms of the global economy and furthermore the economy of this town. So we discovered, ah, perfect. So we discovered um, Jessup, Georgia. Um, right, this one up here. Yeah. Okay, just tell me. That's perfect. Okay. Um, and in talking about what kind of our bottom line is, we really decided that we needed to develop stronger community pride through cultural heritage. How are we going to do that? Um, so in targeting Je Jessup, Audrey, you can move on to the next slide, please. This is an old picture here of the rail depot in Jessup County. Um, we thought that this would be a great place to work with because it already had such a rich cultural history. And in reading about the 2015 census, uh, uh, census excuse me, they had already had a 5.7% uh, drop in population. They had gone from 10,214 citizens to 9,633. So that kind of really hit our prompt on the money. Reading further, we found out uh, that when Jessup was established in 1856, it was established as a rail railroad depot conjoining both the Macon Brunswick Railroad and Atlantic Gulf Railroad. So again, you'll see those right here. Um, so because of that, uh, it creates a connection of resources in the community. Albany County at the time um, of its inquisition, if you will, was one of the leaders in cotton production in the state, and Jessup became an important uh, player in transporting that cotton to the Savannah coast so that could be exported out of the United States. Um, so that port in Savannah was established in 1733, uh, just about a, a century before Jessup had, uh, had instilled its depot. Um, and then this infrastructure, again, because of the agricultural growth of cotton, was really important um, on the landscape of the world market and propelling the economy of the state. Our call to action is to reinvigorate the historic downtown. Our, object, our objective is to revitalize the history narrative of the cotton and textiles manufacturing. Uh, the depot closed, causing a lot of people to leave. And the old factory, the one who's educational methods to strengthen cultural centers. The center of the Chamber of Commerce local community, historical society, building owners, former workers, and legacy connections are our audience. And our strategy is partner with the Chamber of Commerce together, the local community, with the World Cafe. The World Cafe is a situation that we incorporated where we had large groups of people meet together and be able to rotate to do their sharing of their connection with the Jessup community to add their history and also to add knowledge of the value of why so many people left and getting families together who were members, had members that belonged to those factories that were employees, homeowners, business owners in that area. In bringing the stakeholders together, and our stakeholders are the historical society, local community, DB depot factory, we've used that as an aid in narrating the political setting to negotiate the logistics. We pull all these building blocks together in pamphlets and in an expansion of storytelling so that we can get commerce going with the Savannah Port history and using the infrastructure that's already there and having the closed factories to develop our marketplace and to have the storytelling, storytelling circles coming together where we've gotten groups of people in various areas of the diverse community together 
And in this picture, it demonstrates a group that we had together, the storytelling circle, where we kind of just let everyone pass a ball to get the ball rolling so that we can gather that information and be able to bring it together to form our objective and support our objective. Uh, once we finished interviewing the stakeholders that we had involved, we went ahead and evaluated the assets that we had in the community from the information that we were able to get from them and concluded that the railroad depot, the local crafting community, the agricultural community, the historical society, and the town square were all available for us to utilize to help rebuild and revitalize some of the town history and the infrastructure. Um, we then proposed the strategy of doing this as a civic practice that was collaborative and partially hosted, so that way what we're doing is facilitating uh, the construction of a, a market that can actually utilize the agricultural history and the crafting communities to um, reinvigorate some of the commerce. Uh, we wanted to make this incredibly collaborative with us and the community because we needed their involvement and their input as much as possible. We needed their commitment to this initiative as much as possible because this is something that we were going to leave in their hands to control. And so uh, getting all of their input to create an integrated solution was essential to our plan. Uh, when negotiating the proposal for this market, we recognized that the best alternative for us, if they didn't want to go through with our full plan, was to uh, get the Chamber of Commerce to work with the depot owner to help fund the opening of the space for the community uh, as for a gathering space. Um, in the meantime, uh, as that meeting plays, it, it, they, we could be working towards the potential of opening it toward, to the market um, in the future. Uh, but a walk away for us is if the Chamber of Commerce was not willing to invest in building a sustainable market and uh, they simply wanted us to come in and create an exhibit because we didn't feel that that uh, adequately expressed the economic decline of the community. Um, we have the $3,500 granted to us, but we also had to match it, so we chose um, Tickets with cash donations uh, into the market for anybody who wanted to support. Uh, vendor fees were, for, were low, but we did actually have um, vendors supporting that for some of the income. We chose to do apparel and collateral sales to help um, invigorate the, to keep the narrative of the cotton industry and all of that, of the textiles going within the community. Um, we sought foundation support and then applied that to our grant. Our expenses, uh, we came in under budget and we have the administrative fees for ourselves. Uh, we're hiring a band for the opening of the market. Um, and we've got the signage installation graphics for the exhibit that we're doing, AV rental, and the marketing materials and merchandise plus our insurance. Our implementation to find, define our solution, we've it continued with the uh, building and using of cotton made products for our promotional sell offerings. We have the t-shirt as well as the tote. Uh, both of those items are showing historically valued symbols of the train, rail the railroad, the uh, cotton, as well as the entrance into Jessup for the journey to incorporate and infuse the economy of the community so that there can be jobs and so that they can have this offering of the art market and they can have the revenue and they can have a well done plan so that at our leaving everything's in place for them to continue moving forward to keep jobs and money in the area for them to be able to grow the history back. So kind of piggybacking off of Latanya here, we really decided at the beginning of this project that for us a measure of success was creating a model that could be sustainable so that this community is able to continue, man continue to manage the project without our help. And in that, going back to the prompts, what do we need to reinforce? We need to reinforce 
reinforce the loss in population, as well as finding some way to exchange commerce. So um, developing a market and a place in which, from a heritage piece, we could uh, create a narrative for people to build upon and add to and lend stories to, to really invigorate the town and motivate everyone in that town um, to want to put in the sweat equity to make it better again, but also creating a landscape in which we have a little bit of money to catalyze the process. How can we really use that money strategically to give them a structure to work within that, that is focused on making sure that there's going to be an exchange of funds that builds off of the history that's already there and, and the building, for instance, that, that has already been used in this way as a manufacturing center and a transportation center of, of agricultural growth and commerce in the town. Um, so again, just going back to those terms that we defined in the beginning, being able to reinvigorate the community, instill heritage, and exchange, um, create an exchange of commerce with that $3,500 match, we felt that this artist market, um, along with gallery telling the historical narrative of the town and, and instilling a place in which community could come together and converse, was really a sound solution for answering all of those needs of our theoretical prompt. Four. Um, <laughs> right. In a nutshell, our um, project centered around facilitating after-school programming, the local high school, and the surrounding community. Um, but we'll return to more specifics about our prompt after our group and our team introduction. So here we have Sarah Gregory. She is a founding member of the of Makeshift Circus Collective and is the coordinator of their current initiative, Brave Circus Project. Um, and here we have Phil Harris. Um, he is an Atlanta based artist with a focus on studio art, murals, and community engagement. And next to me is Fuluke Beverage. She is a marketing and communications coordinator, with, as well as an artist teacher with a local nonprofit here in Atlanta called Moving in the Spirit. Uh, their focus is youth development, and they gain national recognition. Now we move into the task. Um, we as a team were approached by um, seven parents from a local high school to come up with ideas for after school programming to respond to certain issues. Um, a lack of after school programming due to cut funding at the school. Um, high truancy rates among students, low SAT scores and high dropout rates. Um, we found out that our solutions, they don't have to be limited to strictly san uh, school sanctioned programming, um, but the main requirement was that our ideas represent the ideas and the, uh, excuse me, needs and interests of the 1500 student body, as well as our key stakeholders. So, given our hypothetical scenario, we chose Grady High School. It was kind of a uh, very tangible choice for us. We all have uh, a lot of pool in the general area, in the old Fourth Ward neighborhood, Conchie Highlands area. Uh, Sarah is alumni. She went to Grady High School. Uh, Faluke works in the area with moving in the spirit, and uh, I've done a lot of work in that in the area as well. Uh, so it's kind of a, a neighborhood where we all, you know, work and play. And, uh, and there's also a rich uh, resources, a rich pool of resources that we can pull from in terms of lots of public art, uh, lots of art organizations, uh, and lots of sponsorship opportunities for the program. Okay, so our approach is uh, we started by listening and building relationships, and for us that meant um, attending neighborhood planning meetings, business association, business association meetings, and spending time in the actual community and kind of just observing the natural rhythm of where the students were already gathering and um, all in, a, in an attempt to understand kind of what the values of the community are. And um, yeah, very important to, um, for us to identify where the students are already because we really wanted to meet them there. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, so that, that, um, I almost spoke Spanish. This was, <laughs> after that, <laughs> afterward, um, we moved to identifying the assets, resources, and um, common interest, dreams, and desires. So for us, that meant um, asset mapping with the parents, walking through the actual neighborhood. This is all hypothetical, so this actually didn't happen, but this is 
is what we would do. Um, so walking through the neighborhood with the parents um, that approached us and meeting community members who, meeting other artists in the community who, who could be a part of the uh, project with us and um, also doing surveys and informal interviews and focus groups with teachers, administrators, um, and with the parents and the children of the parents who approached us as well as student leaders um, so that we could identify what would be valuable to them in a program like this. Um, then we, we went back, hypothetically, and sculpted ideas that we um, then presented to the stakeholders. And this would be um, a fluid and evolving process. So we present the ideas, we get feedback, and stakeholders would choose which idea speaks most to them. And um, then we would flush out that process, that, um, that programming idea. And so we have chosen one of the ideas to flesh out. But first I'll tell you what three ideas we came up with. Uh, but before I do that, <laughs> um, so overall, coming up, sculpting the ideas, um, finding out which idea speaks most to the stakeholders, then carrying out a pilot, um, which would not only uh, serve to introduce ourselves to a wider community, um, also it would serve to collect more information about what worked, what didn't work, um, and what the interests of the, of the youth would be. Because you can't just hand a survey to a high schooler and have them like, really necessarily pay attention to it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then we would move on to implementing the programming based on the information that we got. So, the first programming idea, Arts to Academics. Um, so, Arts to Academics would focus on connecting artistic experiences to academic attendance. Thank you. Um, uh, connecting artistic experiences to academic concepts, and we would draw, we would refer to the Every Student Succeeds Act and the <coughs> Department of Education to identify which key concepts we needed to focus on so that we could complement what's already going on in the schools. Uh, that's idea one. Idea two, Monday through Thursday after school programming, so that would be very kind of simple. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, each day would be a different artistic focus that would be facilitated by teaching artists. And at the very end, um, the youth would be working towards a final performance that they would share with the rest of the school. Um, and last but not least, <laughs> the block party. <laughs> you get it? You get it? <laughs> Computer. I don't see the slide in here. Oh, yeah. So sad. Okay, well, there's a picture of a human pyramid in there. That you, could, you guys would have to come to the block party and see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this would start with um, working with student leaders and the seven stu the uh, children of the seven families who approached us to uh, create a big street performance and. Um, in that street performance, it would be in the Grady parking lot, which is where, after our information gathering, we found out that that's where the students hang out. And um, it would be uh, followed by an open workshop. So big street performance, everybody's invited. And then open workshop, you guys can try what you saw. And then during that, you can try what you saw. We would be walking around, and we talked about doing this with video, where we do little interviews, but some people don't want the video, and that's okay too. So we would have different ways of interviewing the youth and finding out what other things would interest them. If we did this space again and continually, what kind of things would you want to learn in this kind of street, outdoor, open workshop type of space? Um, so yeah, and then every Thursday from then on out, there would be, um, Thursday is a day that we would have identified based on what the community said would be the best day. Um, from 2.30 to 5 would be a music-filled space where the youth could come and interact with art that is relevant to them, that is not uh, touched upon in the Grady curriculum. Um, there would be youth training opportunities on the other days of the week for student leaders and the youth of the parents, the kids of the parents who, um, who approached us, um, where they would get to explore interests that they have identified. We would be teaching them and then teaching them how to teach others so that after the pilot, they would help us facilitate the space for other youth. Um, 
that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> and these are some of the things that you would see in the blog party. Boom. Uh -huh. Boom. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> okay, so uh, identifying our assets was very important. We use uh, a tool called asset-based community development to determine um, what assets we had going into this. Uh, one thing we noticed early on was that uh, our stakeholders kind of overlapped into our assets because uh, many of our assets are you know, individuals, associations, institutions. Uh, but in terms of physical assets, what we're focusing on is uh, school property, uh, the vacant parking lot that Sarah mentioned where we would do the programming. Uh, it's a very uh, large and useful asset for us uh, going into this. Uh, we also have public art spaces such as the Beltline and the Piedmont Park. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we have um, uh, there's art galleries in the area there. There's movie theaters uh, that aren't just normal theaters. There are places where you go where a director might come and give a speech before the movie um, and things like that. They might also screen uh, independent movies that you wouldn't see anywhere else. So it's a very rich arts uh, area in general, generally speaking. But it's all broken down right here, our assets. Uh, so next we'll take a look at our stakeholders. We have parent, uh, and a lot of this is it's you know a given. Parents, students, administrators. We have uh, teachers. Uh, our local businesses, sponsors, business organizations, art supply stores, uh, and uh, not to forget the neighborhood organizations as well. So in order to get all this right, our messaging strategy was very important. Um, we uh, had to do uh, stakeholder, stakeholder messaging and communicate uh, the value that all the stakeholders are receiving from this. The parents obviously are going to, uh, they have a, a lot of value to get out of this by putting their children on the path of success. The students can have a sense of belonging, connection, and relevance, uh, and while addressing the attrudency rates and so forth and getting them uh, motivated again. <clears throat> the administrators and uh, sponsors and all of our other partners uh, have the ability to receive a lot of recognition from this as well. <laughs> oh man. Oh, look at this. I wanted to have the computer. Really, y'all? Okay, but well, it that's just our picture. Okay, so we had a, a lovely picture of the human pyramid. And, um, Sarah was at the top, and we really wanted to take a moment and um, just speak to the fact that we can't do working together in community. We can create magic, uh -huh. and human pyramids are pretty magical looking. I'm just really sad. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but that was really like a, a nice break moment that we wanted to work in, but. Um, but anyway, uh, we, before getting started, we really had to um, figure out where we were, like what we were working with before we started on this project, um, get an idea of both our internal and external situations, and uh, SWOT analysis. Um, before I go into this, I wanted to make a note that this SWOT that we came up with was an initial analysis, so we understand that since this is a process, things will probably shift as, as uh, time went on. So this would not be a final slide, but um, just wanted to make that comment. Um, the strength that main strength that I wanted to uh, that we wanted to bring out was our familiarity as a team with the community. So um, that I think that allows us to sort of hit the ground running because we have a um, better idea of what's already going on here. Um, we have team members. All of us live and work and play and so forth in this area, so um, you know it really well. Um, and then the other part that we wanted to bring out that's actually not listed here is that one of our team members is um, a circus artist and we really wanted to um, speak to why that's valuable to the project that we're trying to do. So, um, in my experience teaching circus, it's just, it's very inviting. So for some, for folks who might not think that art is for them, um, thank you. Um, so it's a, yeah, high school student, probably not going to stop 
their busy social schedule to step into an art space when it's not something that's very like they may and I've seen it happen um, stop if they see someone juggling seven balls or standing on top of somebody's shoulders and doing all these wild things honest and um, so for that reason circus can kind of uh, work as a bridge to draw people in and then they may or may not end up doing circus but they'll be there which is an opportunity for us to build the relationships so that they might decide to do spoken word poetry or you know, uh, street art or any of the other things that we would be offering there. So it's a very, very strong um, draw. Um, as far as our weaknesses go, we really wanted to talk about our lack of funding, um, both as a, as a team and then it was really an external thing as well and that the school has cut funding for after school programming. Um, we've already planned to seek um, in-kind donations from local businesses in addition to sponsorships and um, grant writing, obviously, to address this short funding. Um, our opportunities, um, one that we wanted to point out was that it doesn't have to be school sanctioned, that the ideas that we come up with don't have to have um, school buy-in, which allows us more freedom to create um, artistic experiences and like fill in that gap outside of the school. Um, and for our threats, um, again, talking about a lack of, potential lack of school buy-in, they might not want us to, to do anything on campus. And again, we've already, but we can mitigate that through the, the opportunity that we presented um, where we can branch outside of the school. So even as far as the block party is concerned, if need be, we could try to you know, use a park for that purpose or some other space where we could um, attract the students with our street performance. Um, as far as the level of autistic art autonomy we want to um, sort of cultivate is concerned, we understand that this is a process. So going in, this might a co-creative process might not um, be what happens from the very beginning. But um, this is the goal that we're shooting for. We don't want to impose ourselves, our ideas, our needs, and so forth on the community. We want this to be a, um, a group effort with all the stakeholders involved. Um, and it's also, you notice we have some hosted elements that is because we're each bringing our particular artistic talents to bear on the programming, so offering you know, I've, I'm also an interplayer, so an improvisational movement, voice storytelling form. Um, we, I would present a structure and allow folks to create through the structure that I present, as with Phil and Sarah. This was this was sort of uh, interesting for us as a group to wrap our head around documentation. Um, just the way that we wanted to approach it at first was very straightforward, um, definitely taking pictures, you know, keeping track of the notes and so forth, but we were challenged to come up with, um, with more artistic ways, like think outside of the box in terms of our documentation um, techniques. So um, like Sarah talked about earlier, short video interviews, like using the block party as a vehicle to get student interest. Um, using, um, having our stakeholders, instead of just writing down, like filling out surveys themselves, they could get butcher paper and visually represent how they feel and what they're interested in. Um, and even um, down to creating, a, for dissemination purposes, creating a private Facebook group or a blog to, sh to spread the information, or share the information that we come up with. Share what's being created, yeah. Um, so this is the budget, I won't go into it, but um, just to point out that there, the community guest artists that we identify in the asset mapping in the beginning are also included in the budget so that this can come for the community itself. Um, the, those are the, the prior one was the expenses, this is the income, it does match. Um, we identify grants that we could apply for as well as businesses that could be sponsors in the area. We have a, a friend that also went to Grady High School that works at the CVS in the area, so we're just kind of, you know, identifying those, those connections that are really important to making these things successful. So, um, given our prompt, the creation of a space on school campus that invites the least engaged youth to find a sense of belonging, safety, support, um, nourishment, and excitement would be our focus. Um, and the block party is a flexible, flexible? Flexible, <laughs> stru <laughs> flexible structure that lends itself to student and community leadership. Um, so the pilot would be phase one in responding to the community's need. 
and um, the program would continue to sculpt itself as we continue to deepen, deepen our understanding of what the community needs and wants. Um, yeah, Dusty? Yeah, yeah. <laughs>